Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to a video about um, some past exam questions about aggregate supply side policies for 2020. It's a little bit weird because half of this area study, so Unit 4 area study 2, has been cut away now. So we're dealing with a much smaller batch of content, which also means that we've got way fewer past exam questions to pull from, which means there's less things you can get asked about potentially, but also you've got less options of what you can look at to try and find out what's been successful in the past and trying to work from that. But we'll get right into it. Um, I'm gonna start off with a few general tips. I'm gonna look at a few multiple choice questions and then look at a couple exam questions and then one question that I've made up that I reckon could be similar to what comes up this year. So we'll get into it now. So some key tips before we go into it. So when you talk about aggregate supply, so when we talked about aggregate demand, we always talked about the components. So consumption, investment, um, government spending, exports and imports. With aggregate supply, you're always talking about one of two things. You're talking about either a change in the productivity or efficiency of a business or a change in cost of production because of that policy. So no matter what the policy is, you need to go from that policy to how it affects one of those two things. And then from how it affects one of those two things, you can go into how that affects the overall productive capacity or the level of production and then aggregate supply. And it leads to like almost all of your answers follow the exact same structure. So you could talk about the fact of education and training. And if they increase, they spend $2 billion on job trainer for education and training, this um, hopefully then increases the skill of labor in the labor pool. And therefore means that when people are employed, they're going to be more productive that means they're getting more output per unit of input. Therefore, this increases our productive capacity and aggregate supplies increased overall. If we look at the JobKeeper wage subsidy, that pays wages for businesses. So that decreases the cost of production, makes them more likely to want to produce or continue producing. And therefore, they're going to keep labor on also, obviously, but also keep producing, which maintains our productive capacity and hopefully maintains our aggregate supply. I'd avoid saying increase our aggregate supply with um, JobKeeper, mainly because it was given to businesses just so they wouldn't lay everyone off. So it's not actually increasing it, it's just kind of trying to maintain it and limit the negative effects. So from either of these changes, you go on to talk about how this increases production or our productive capacity and therefore aggregate supply as well. So now let's get into some multiple choice questions. So. With multiple choice in aggregate supply, um, they love to talk, ask questions where it's like, they'll give you four examples of policies with increase or decrease or whatever. And you have to talk about which one is either least likely to increase aggregate supply, which of the following has a different effect. Um, they love which of the following has a different effect from the others or which would have a different effect on aggregate supply. So we'll go through these one by one and talk about the answers. So question five from 2019, which of the following budgetary policy initiatives is least likely to increase the aggregate supply in the economy? So an increase in skilled migration program, increased government expenditure on education, the construction of a new freeway in Melbourne, and a 10% increase in new start allowance provided by the Australian government. So let's look at all of these and write next to them what they'll do. So we'll do that in red. So if there's an increase in skilled migration, well, that's gonna increase our productive capacity and increase our aggregate supply because we're gonna have more skilled labor and we're gonna be more productive. Increase government expenditure on education. Well, people are going to be more skilled. Increase the aggregate supply. New freeway, infrastructure spending. Increase aggregate supply. We're going to be have a greater productive capacity overall. A 10% increase in new style allowance. So more generous welfare. That's probably going to decrease aggregate supply because in this instance, if welfare is more generous, why are people going to want to work? So therefore, this ends up being the correct answer because that's going to decrease the aggregate supply because people are less likely to want to work as I do the dodgiest highlighting of all time. So that is the answer there because that's the only one that decreases the aggregate supply. Of the so this is question four from 2018. Of the following policy initiatives, which, of, which one is least likely to increase aggregate supply? So least likely which one isn't going to increase aggregate supply? Which one is going to decrease aggregate supply? one of those kind of options. So increased government spending on infrastructure, increased government spending on education and training, increased government outlays allocated to the payment of unemployment benefits and a reduction in company tax rates. So let's get out our pen again. Increased government spending on infrastructure, as we said from the last question, that will increase accurate supply. Increased government spending on education and training, same as before, increase accurate supply. Nice and easy there. 
increased government outlays allocated to the payment of unemployment benefits. Well, that's oddly similar to what we had in D from before. If you pay more in welfare, people aren't going to work as much. So decreased aggregate supply. And then lastly, a reduction in company tax rates. The company's going to have a lower cost of production. That is going to increase aggregate supply overall because they're going to be more willing to want to produce. As you can see, this is two years in a row. They asked almost the exact same question, just in different words. So that's when we get C, the increased government outlays is going to be the answer where that's the only that's going to be least likely to increase aggregate supply because people are going to be less likely to want to work. And therefore, they are going to choose to remain unemployed because they're getting enough money for it. It's the big thing at the moment with Job Seeker. Then question six from 2017. Over time, which of the following would be most likely to increase aggregate supply in the economy? So which would increase aggregate supply overall? So we've got A, reducing the age pension, B, reducing skilled migration, C, um, reducing the retirement age, and D, reducing funding for apprenticeships. So let's have a look at these. Let's go in reverse order to mix it up. Why not? So reducing funding for apprenticeships, well, if we have less funding for apprenticeships, less people are going to become apprentices. We're going to have less labor in that area. That's going to make us less productive and decrease our aggregate supply overall. Reducing the retirement age. So people, I think it's 65 at the moment, the retirement age. Let's say people can retire at, retire at 50. So that'd be 19 years away, which would be pretty sweet. Um, that's going to decrease aggregate supply because we're going to have less labor available because people are going to stop working and retire because then they can live off their sweet, sweet pension. Um, reducing skilled migration. Once again, less skilled labor coming into the country. It's going to reduce our aggregate supply. And then lastly, reducing the age pension. Well, people, if they are reducing the age pension, if people retire, they're going to get less money from the government. That is going to actually, uh, would be most likely to increase aggregate supply because people are going to be more likely to maintain working because they're not going to want to live retired, but and essentially poverty. So reducing the age pension is the one that's most likely going to increase our overall aggregate supply because people are going to want to keep working because they're going to get a better wage and a better standard of living. Now let's move on to some short answer questions. Which I don't know why they call them short answer in economics because some of the answers are pretty long, but we'll deal with that anyway. So question four from 2018. Um, we're starting off 2018 because I went through 2019 and the questions were really specific to things you don't need to know this year. So select one of the following budgetary policies, um, so re research and development grants or subsidies, and explain how the selected aspect is designed to influence aggregate supply and the achievement of one of the government's domestic macroeconomic goals for three marks. So how I'd break this down, one mark would come from explaining the policy with reference to a recent example, the impact on aggregate supply overall, so the impact on our productivity or productive capacity and aggregate supply, and the impact on the goal with a definition of the goal. So you could go either way with this. It was answered fairly well, I believe. Um, I think the average was about 2 out of 3 or 2.5 out of 3, which is pretty good um, considering. And so we'll get into a sample answer. So I went with subsidies, mainly because using JobKeeper subsidy is my go-to at the moment for aggregate supply side. So Subsidies are a payment to a producer or a consumer which are designed to increase production or consumption of a good or service. So JobKeeper was a recent wage subsidy introduced in 2020 to limit the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on the overall unemployment rate. Um, I'd probably also add there and our overall level of production. Um, the subsidy was paid by the government to businesses who have been adversely impacted by the pandemic to lower their production costs and therefore allow them to retain their labor resources. This Lynn, helps to lessen the overall impact of the pandemic on our productive capacity and the rate of aggregate supply and allows for a faster recovery at the end of the pandemic. This also prevents unemployment from increasing at a faster rate, which helps keep us closer to achieving the goal of full employment, which is the lowest rate of unemployment possible without unnecessary inflationary or external pressures where 4.5 to 5% of people are naturally unemployed. One key thing here, um, hopefully you notice at the end here, because it's about the achievement of one of the government ec domestic economic goals, one weird thing this year is a lot of what the government's putting in place in both aggregate demand and aggregate si supply side policies isn't actually to achieve the goal, it's to lessen the negative impact on that goal. And I'm kind of hoping that on the end of your exam, when it comes to marking it, 
they're going to really hone in on that kind of thing to separate the highest answers from the lowest, the like kind of regular answers. And so if you're really specific about that kind of thing, you're the most correct because they aren't technically trying to achieve the goal of full employment at the moment. They're trying to lessen the negative impact of all these, like the um, global pandemic on that goal of full employment. So um, obviously there's things that have said that if the government didn't put in place like JobKeeper, et cetera, unemployment would be at around 15% right now, but we've been hovering around 7.2, 7.4. Um, and it's expected to go up a little bit more, but it's lessened the overall impact and therefore helped us from getting too far away from the achievement of full employment. So really simply to break this down, kind of like the first little bit, I don't know why I'm trying to point to my screen here. Um, so the first little bit is about um, subsidies and JobKeeper, that's the first mark how it affects aggregate supply, the second mark, and then the last part, the overall impact on the goal of full employment is your third mark. A decent amount in there for three marks that you need to do, but um, not too difficult overall. Next, question 1D from 2017. So it's very, very similar, but adds an extra option. So select one of the following aspects of budgetary policy, spending on training and education, research and development grants and subsidies, and explain how increased funding on this aspect of budgetary policy might influence aggregate supply and the goal of strong and sustainable economic growth. So they take away full employment and throw in strong and sustainable economic growth and also include spending on education and training. So your first mark here for the three marks, describe one of the um, aggregate supply side policies with reference to a recent example. One mark comes from how it effect, impacts aggregate supply overall. And your last mark comes from how it impacts the goal of strong and sustainable economic growth, along with the definition of strong and sustainable economic growth. So if we get into that now, a sample answer, which I've kind of updated a little bit because you don't want policies from 2017 in your answer because that's not recent. So we've added a new one in here. Um, so we stole this from VCAR and added job trainer to it. So an increase in spending on training and education is designed to improve the quality of labor resources. Examples of these policies can include the job trainer package, which was announced in 2020 and placed $2 billion of funding towards education and training, um, increasing spending on education and training aims to improve skills of current and future members of the labor force, which in turn raises average labor productivity levels in the economy and increases the nation's aggregate supply and productive capacity. By increasing aggregate supply and productive capacity, this will likely reduce average production costs, thus boosting the willingness and ability of producers to supply. It will also mean that the economy is able to achieve higher rates of economic growth without a buildup of inflationary pressure thereby increasing the economy's ability to achieve strong, sustainable economic growth. All right, so if we are to look at this and break it down to where the marks are. So the first little bit, the talking about education and training and the example of it, one of the marks. Then we've got how that would then affect aggregate supply is the next mark. And then the last one is how it would then achieve the goal of strong, sustainable economic growth. Um, I always tend to define the goal as well. So I'd probably say the goal of strong, sustainable economic growth is the highest growth rate possible um, without running into unnecessary inflationary external or environmental pressures at a rate of um, 3 to 3.5% GDP growth per year. But that is up to you overall. I prefer to include it because I feel like it gives a stronger answer in general. Then the last question we've got, I made up. So I made up SAC style question for 2020. Discuss how investment in infrastructure can help achieve the goal of full employment for four marks. I went for a four mark one here because I feel like with less options of what they can ask about, um, VCAR is probably more likely to ask some higher mark questions about some of these things specifically, rather than like you've seen the last few questions where it's been like, choose one of the three, you're probably more likely to get questions specifically about each if they wanna use a fair few aggregate supply side questions. So one mark would come from describing infrastructure spending, one mark would come from a recent example, one mark would be the short-term impact on the goal of full employment, and one mark would come from the long-term impact on the goal of full employment. And I'd say the goal should be defined, otherwise you might lose a mark there. So to get into my sample for this, so infrastructure spending refers to the government outlays on projects which improve the key physical or organizational structures within an economy such as roads, electricity, airports, telecommunications, etc. So one policy that they have used recently, or one example of infrastructure spending, is investing $2 billion to help deliver a fast rail connection between Geelong and Melbourne, which in the short term will help create demand for labour to facilitate the project and therefore decrease the unemployment rate, which helps to achieve the goal of full employment 
which is the lowest unemployment rate possible without unnecessary inflationary or external pressure, where only 4.5 to 5% of natural unemployment exists. In the long term, once the rail network is established, this can improve the overall efficiency of businesses as transport times and costs are decreased. This means that businesses will be more likely to invest and expand, therefore creating more demand for labor and decreasing unemployment, once, um, which once again helps to achieve the goal of full employment. So if we look at that, we've got um, in a few different spots here, we have the first mark, which comes from talking about what infrastructure spending is. Then we've got for the second mark, an example of a um, recent infrastructure spending. We've got the short term impact along with the goal of what it is and the long term impact. And that breaks down very quickly into saying all the different effects of it overall. And that's pretty much it. So hopefully this was kind of helpful in talking about your last area of study, kind of things you're expected to use in answers when you are talking about aggregate supply side policies. If you have any questions at all, feel free to send me a message or an email. My email is just in the description below. Other than that, I hope you have a wonderful day and I will probably have another video at some point talking about some other exam type things. Have a great day. Bye.